I just want to begin with this question. How do you encourage yourself when you feel discouraged? Think for a moment, what do you usually do when you are discouraged? I know some people find shopping really therapeutic. I think you may have heard of this saying, when the going gets tough, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough, that's an old one. <laughs> they have a new one that goes like this. When the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. <laughs> there was a survey that was conducted um, among men and women, and they found that more than half the men and women actually admitted to resorting to engaging in retail therapy, the act of spending and um, the act of shopping and spending to improve one's mood. There are other people who resort to comfort eating or maybe emotional eating as a way of dealing with stress or anxiety or sadness. Well, those of us who are believers, probably we may respond to discouragement by coming to the Lord in prayer or turning to His Word. You may have heard the story about this young man who was faced with a very difficult situation and he was really discouraged because he had exhausted all means of trying to find a solution to his problems. And so as a last resort, he decided to turn to the Word of God. But he hardly read the Word of God, so he didn't really know where to begin, where to turn to. And so just before he turned to the Word of God, he muttered a short prayer and said, Oh Lord, have mercy, help me. And so what he did was that he just turned the Bible at random and his eyes fell on the verse in Matthew 27, verse 5, that says, And he, Judas, went and hanged himself. Then the young man thought to himself, It can't be. Let me try one more time. So he turned the pages of the Bible one more time. And this time, his eyes fell on Luke chapter 10, verse 37. And he says, Go and do likewise. <laughs> then he said, no, God, God can't be telling me this. It can't be. Let me try just one last time. So he turned the pages of the Bible again, and this time his eyes fell on the words in John chapter 13, verse 27. And he says, whatever you are about to do, do it quickly. <laughs> Has anyone tried? <laughs> Has anyone tried this random method of trying to seek God's direction, please don't raise your hand. <laughs> if ever God spoke to us <clears throat> through this random method of finding direction, it is out of His great mercy and grace for us. And most times, God's wisdom and direction comes to us through our knowledge of His Word. And just at the right time, just at a time when we most needed it, He would Bring a specific, His Holy Spirit will quicken a specific word to our hearts just at the right time when we need it. And some weeks ago, when I was feeling kind of discouraged, I sought the Lord for a word of direction and comfort. And I was led to read Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. Now, I have read this psalm on different occasions and there was really nothing in particular that struck a chord. But this time, as I was reading it, literally it was as though the words were jumping out at me. And in, particularly, in particular, the words, with all my heart, which is the message, the title of my message for today. And on, you will find that on at least six occasions, the word, with all my heart, is repeated in this psalm. And on three occasions, it has to do with seeking God with all my heart. Psalm 119 verse 2 says, Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Psalm 119 verse 58, it says, I have sought your face with all my heart. 
And on other occasions, when the word with all my heart is mentioned, it has to do with obey with all my heart or call with all my heart. And as you read the psalm, you will find that there are other words that goes like this. All your words are true. Your stages are fully trustworthy. I will consider all your precepts. I will keep all your precepts with all my heart. So what was the Lord trying to tell me? Very simply, that I was to be wholehearted in my pursuit of Him, like the psalmist who treasured His word above everything else. And if I were to seek Him with all my heart, to know Him and to understand His ways, I will never fail to find Him in my time of need. The more I know Him, the more I will understand the way He works in my life and through my life, in and through my ministry. What does it mean to seek the Lord? To put it simply, seeking the Lord means seeking His presence. And presence is a common translation of the Hebrew word face in the Old Testament. Many times in the scripture, you will find that God's people are encouraged to seek His face. For example, Psalm 105 verse 4, Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. A person's face, right, reveal much about his character and his personality. When we talk about seeking God's face, it means that we are seeking to know Him, to understand His character and hear His voice more than what He can give to us. And it is interesting to note that while scriptures talk about seeking God's face, there is no mention even once of seeking God's hand. And there's a huge difference between seeking God's face, which is his, God's person and presence, and seeking His hand, which is God's power and blessings. You see, if we seek God's face, sorry, if we seek God's hand, we will very likely miss His face. But if we seek His face, we will find His hand of power as well. The secret to experiencing the power and blessings of God is to seek the manifest presence of God. To put it simply, seek God to know Him and not just to get things from Him. Seek God to know Him, not for what you can get from Him. So, if, what is your need this morning? Don't just, if you are seeking healing, don't just seek healing. Seek the healer. Seek the Lord. He is not just the giver, but He is both the giver and the gift. And I would say that He is the greatest gift among all other gifts that we are seeking for. The gift of God's manifest presence in leading us, in guiding us, in working in us and through us. This is what makes a difference in our lives and that which sets us apart from people who do not know the Lord. Scriptures provide numerous examples of how the presence of the Lord empowers His people to live for Him. And one of the most powerful examples in the Bible is the life of Moses. And Moses was very convinced that without God's manifest presence in his life, it was actually useful, useless for him to attempt anything else. And that's why he said to the Lord in Exodus chapter 33, he said to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. This was his prayer to the Lord in Exodus chapter 33, verse 13. He says, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. So Moses' prayer to the Lord was, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Then when we read Psalm 103 verse 7, it says, He, the Lord, make known his ways to Moses his deeds to the people of Israel. Notice the difference. 
God's acts or deeds were made known to the entire nation of Israel, but his ways were only made known to Moses. And this was in answer to Moses' prayer. And the Lord showed him, made known to Moses his ways, his character, the laws of his providence, the grand purposes of his heart. But unlike Moses, the people of Israel did not want to know God's ways. They actually preferred to have a go between so that they don't have to come, they didn't have to come into the presence of God for themselves. When the Lord made manifest his presence on Mount Sinai, the people were afraid and they said to Moses in Exodus 20, verse 19, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God to speak to us or else we will die. They, they witnessed many, many mighty acts that the Lord performed in their midst. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They witnessed the provision of the daily manna. They saw the cloud that led them by day and the fiery pillar that led them by night. And there was a long list of miracles that we witnessed, but their hearts were hardened to such an extent that God actually called them a stiff-necked people. They were only after the demonstration of God's acts but they were not interested to know him, to seek him and to know his ways. And is it any wonder why they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years? What about you and me this morning? I think it goes without saying that all of us would like to see the demonstration of the acts of God, isn't it? But the question is, how much time are we devoting to seeking to know God and to learn his ways like Moses? What drives you to seek God and his presence? Our pursuit of God can begin in one of two places. Firstly, a lot of people begin where they are in the midst of their problems. They are driven by their challenges to seek God. This may not be the best starting point, but for many, it is the pressing challenges in life that cause, cause them to seek God. But you see, starting with our problems often causes, comes with it a lot of stress, anxiety, and confusion. Let me give you an example. How many of you actually read the user's manual when you purchase a gadget on equipment to find out how it works? How many of you read the manual? Not many. I think I am one of those who dislike reading manuals, I find it very laborious. And what I would rather have someone give me very quick tips on how the thing works, right? Um, but the problem is, people can only tell you to a certain extent how the thing works. So, what happens when the thing is not functioning as it should? So what do you do? Well, for me, that's when I have no choice, though, but to start reading the manual to find out what went wrong and what should I do. But by then, right, I am usually already very stressed. And I read and read the manual, but I can't really understand what it means because there are just too many technical terms. And then I call up Pastor David and he says, look up the manual law. If it doesn't work, call the work centre law. I, uh, as if I don't know. <laughs> I also know that. Lah. I just want to short circuit the process, but now I'm back to square one and it, and it looks like, well, you, you just have to read the manual, right? So by now you can imagine my stress level. And in that mental state, in that kind of mental state, it is hard to process things properly. So similarly, when we are driven by our problems to seek God, we may not be in the right state of mind mentally and emotionally to process all that is happening. So there can be a tendency for us to interpret God through our circumstances because of our lack of knowledge of Him and how He works. And by that I mean we form our conclusions about God based on our outward circumstances and our experience of Him in these circumstances. If God really cares for me, 
then why is he allowing all these bad things to happen to me? You see, when we look at our challenges with the tiny, our tiny lens, and we try to figure out God's purposes with our own finite understanding, we may find ourselves running into a lot of problems. So, actually, the best starting point in our pursuit of God is God Himself. And this will inevitably lead us to His Word, which gives us a solid hope. When we seek God to know Him and not to use Him, we will find ourselves in a better position to face the challenges that come our way. We will then learn to interpret our circumstances through the lens of His Word instead of interpreting Him through our circumstances. That means we will not judge His purposes by what we see in the mirror of our own expectations or what we see around us. We will not draw our conclusions about who God is based on our circumstances and our experience in the circumstances. Given the same set of challenges, we, would, we will not question His love for us. We will instead look at our circumstances and begin to interpret it through the lens of God's Word. And there are many scriptures that will help us to interpret our circumstances. And we will now remember the words of Jesus in John 16, verse 33, that tells us, Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. So when we interpret our circumstances in the light of God's Word, through the leading of His Holy Spirit, of course, we will always find Him every time. But if we look for God elsewhere than other than His Word, we may not find Him in our time of need because we may be looking in all the wrong places for Him, and we have our own presupposition of how He ought to work things out in our lives. So what drives you to seek God and pursue His presence? If our primary motivation for pursuing God is to seek Him for a victory and breakthrough in a specific of area of our lives, it is very likely that we may not last very long in the pursuit. Often the pursuit ends when we have already received that victory or breakthrough. But when we seek God for Himself, that is to know Him, He will reveal Himself to us. The more He reveal Himself to us, the more we will know Him. The more we know Him, the more we will understand His ways and His heart towards us. And that's why the Apostle, pray, the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. We know God primarily through His Word. But we cannot approach the Bible like any other book because it's a very different book. And if we read it like a textbook or because we have to finish our one-year Bible reading plan, or we have to fulfill some requirements like the Royal Rangers or the Missionettes, we will find that you won't get anything out of it because your motive in the first place was not to seek the God of the Bible. It was just to fulfill an obligation and some requirement. And is it any wonder that you found the word dry and cut? There are 245 million Christians around the world who are facing high levels of persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. And many of them are actually risking their lives to possess a Bible or to meet in secret places just to study the Word of God. And yet, those of us who are in the free world, who have the privilege of owning a Bible, do not actually read it for all it's worth. A stark contrast in responses, isn't it? Why the difference? Isn't it the same Bible that we are reading? Without a doubt. But why the difference? Evidently, maybe the persecuted Christians have re experienced something so remarkable about the Bible that they are willing to put their lives at stake and for, for the sake of owning the Bible and they would rather lose their lives than lose what they have found. Or maybe perhaps 
for us here who are in the free world, we do not see the need to read the Bible as much because we think that we can get by without the Word. We don't have problems like the persecuted church. We can make it on our own. After all, we have been getting along all along fine, isn't it? With minimal reading of the Bible. What difference does it really make whether I read the Bible or not? Well, if we really look at it, right, this is a spirit of independence and self-sufficiency that actually stem from pride. Yes, pride does stand in the way of us seeking the Lord through His Word. And humility is essential to seeking the Lord. And unless we approach the Word of God with a right motive and attitude, we will not be able to discover the depths of the riches of God's Word that give us the revelation knowledge of who God is as He reveals Himself in the Bible, not as we want Him to reveal Himself to us. And we all know God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And that is why we cannot approach scriptures with a secular mindset or with a worldly point of view. And Paul recognizes this. And therefore, he prays that God will give us, God will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that our understanding will be enlightened to know God as He has revealed Himself to us in His Word. And that is why the psalmist prays too. In Psalm 119, verse 18, Amplified Version, it says, Open my eyes to spiritual truth so that I may behold wonderful things from your law. The psalmist recognized that without God and God's enlightenment, he could not see what he could and should see from the Word of God. And there are many wondrous things in Scripture which can only be seen when our eyes are enlightened by the Spirit to see God as He is. And that is why it is so vital for us to pray and ask the Lord to open our eyes when he, we read His Word so that we will be able to behold the wonderful truths about Him that is found in His Word, without which the Word will be like a dry crust of bread instead of daily manna for our soul. There are amazing treasures in the Word of God that leads to a life of fullness in Christ. Didn't Jesus say, I have come that they might have life to the full? The purpose that God gave us His Word is so that we will be able to discover and experience life to the full just as He has intended. And as believers, we are destined to live as children of the Most High King. But unfortunately, many believers, many of God's children are living like spiritual paupers and content with being so. They have set up for what they think is good. But the problem is the good is the enemy of the best. And in settling for the good, they have robbed themselves of God's best for their lives. May the Lord open our eyes to behold wonderful, wonderful truths from His Word that will keep us seeking Him more and more continually. And just to share a recent experience that I had to illustrate this truth, may not be the best perfect example, it's actually a very technical experience, but which was for me an illumination of a spiritual truth. And it has to do with my handphone, actually. Um, I recently found out some amazing things that it could do, which I never knew in all my life that it could do. It's a two-year-old phone, but I won't mention what kind of phone it is because I'm not here to promote phones or gadgets. I'm here to promote the Word of God. And I'm sure, like me, some of you may have those light bulb moments when you see, oh, you mean this gadget is actually capable of performing all these different things that I never knew it could do, right? And there were about 30 things that I found out it could do, but I just, just to mention two interesting things. I found out that it could actually read, check and read my email for me. I just say, read my latest email, and to my amazement, it did. And the other thing is a bit creepy, I discovered that my phone has actually tracked every location that I have been since I activated it. And it has a complete history of all the places that I frequent. And it could tell me how many times I've been to Calvary Church Damansara Heights this year. And it can actually tell me all the dates I've been there, how long I've been there. It's very, very creepy. 
And I made, when I made all these amazing discoveries about my phone, right, I began to look at it very differently. And I said to myself, whoever came up with this is a genius. But who gave this genius such wonderful knowledge? Who gave man the creativity and intellect to create such a wonderful gadget? And all of a sudden, there was this sense of awe and wonder that came over me. And I said, I want to know this creator who gave man the creativity and the intellect to create such powerful things. I want to know that creator. Not that I don't know the creator, but I want to know him even more. Now my point is this. If God can use a technical discovery like this to inspire me to seek him, how much more can he use the amazing truths of his word to draw us to himself? As wonderful as these gadgets are, they are not life-giving. It is only the Word of God. The Word of God is life-giving and it is life-transforming. And you know what? The more we discover the amazing truths of God's Word, the more we catch a glimpse, the more we catch glimpses of His glory, the more we want to seek Him. And the more we want to seek Him, the more we will experience His manifest presence in our lives and the fullness of the abundant life that He has meant for us to enjoy. And won't you agree with me that the greatest pursuit in life at the end of the day really is to know God, isn't it? Because the one thing that truly satisfies in life is knowing God. If life's greatest purpose is knowing God, it follows that life's greatest challenge is also knowing God. There are so many things that seek to compete for our attention and our affection. We find ourselves having a divided heart, being pulled in so many different directions and torn between loyalties. And the psalmist recognises this real struggle. And here in Psalm 119 verse 10, he declares his aspiration to seek God wholeheartedly while at the same time recognizing that recognizing his own weakness to maintain such a dedication and that's why he he says i seek you with all my heart do not let me stray from your commands and he sees the potential track of many things that stand in the way of him seeking god and following god wholeheartedly and that's why he prays in verses 36 to 38, he says in the Amplified Version, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain and envy. Turn my eyes away from vanity, all those worldly, meaningless things that distract. Let your priorities be mine and restore me with renewed energy in your ways. What are some things that distract you from seeking God? Is it your work that is consuming all your time and energy so that you come home so tired and with no time to do anything else? Is it something that you do during your free time seemingly to de-stress and to relax and that has now become an addiction and which robs you of the time that you could actually have spent in prayer and reading the word of God? Is it that gadget in your hand that causes you to be glued to a screen for the bigger part of your waking hours? Whatever the distractions may be, will you pray like the psalmist? Lord, incline my heart to your word. Turn my eyes away from things that distract and let your priorities be mine. Why do you think scriptures exhort us to seek the Lord with all our heart. Why? Why is it that scriptures often exhort us to seek the Lord with all our hearts, to love the Lord with all our hearts? Because God knows this, that if we seek Him with 50% of our heart, there can be a tendency for the other 50% that is devoted to other things to overtake whatever affection we have for Him. And in time to come, it can even totally snuff out our desire for Him. 
we just don't backslide overnight, right? Usually it begins with a little slack here, a little slack there, and before you know it, you find yourself dragging your feet to come to church, and you rather find seemingly more profitable, more profitable things to do at home on a Sunday rather than to come to the service and listen to the same old, same old sermon. Now, seeking God is not just about turning away from the things that distract or draw us away from God, because really, it's not about don't do this because it kills your desire for God, but it is also about what can I do to fuel my desire to seek God. If we are to seek God with our whole heart, we must be convicted of the worthiness and the value of the one we are seeking. There needs to be an awareness of the beauty, the splendor, the majesty, the glory, and the overwhelming love of the one we are seeking for us, such that we desire to make him our greatest pursuit and the object of our affection. And it is when we see how worthy and how desirable He is that we endeavour to give our maximum effort in seeking and pursuing Him. And this is the psalmist's experience that leads him to make this declaration. Verse 72, he says, The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousand pieces of silver and gold. Can we actually say with great conviction like the psalmist, Lord, your word is more precious to me than all the money that I can earn from my business or from whatever it is you are doing. Obviously, the psalmist must have encountered the Lord in a very, very tangible way over the course of his life journey to be able to make such a declaration and to make a further claim, in verses 111 and 112, he says, Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is seeking, my heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Do we, like the psalmist, rejoice in the word of God with such deep, heartfelt joy that it just inspires us to keep and obey his word to the very end? Of course, we do not arrive there overnight, isn't it? It is a conscious choice on our part to direct our heart towards God. I think we all know that our heart is prone to wonder. And so, if you don't direct your heart toward God, your heart will direct you and lead you away from God. Seeking God is the conscious, consistent, fixing of our mind's attention and heart's affection on Him. The psalmist says in verses 30, 31, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. While seeking God is a conscious effort on our part, we need to realise that we cannot do it on our own. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us in our pursuit of God. It was the Holy Spirit who drew us to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the first place. And He is here to reveal Jesus to us more and more as we acknowledge our humble dependence on Him and as we make room for Him to work in our lives. We have talked much about pursuing God. What is the outcome of pursuing God? God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How does God reward those who diligently seek him? He rewards them with his manifest presence. Listen to what the psalmist says. In verses 150 to 151, those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, Lord, and all your commandments, all your commands are through. The psalmist was very keenly aware of God's manifest presence with him 
in a time of danger where the wicked who opposed him were coming closer to him and posing a real danger to him. Are you just as confident of God's presence with you when you are confronted with evil? The level of confidence that you have in God will come from your consistent times of seeking Him. Because when you have experienced His presence in the sanctuary, you can therefore be confident of His presence with you when you are confronted with evil. Secondly, those who seek the Lord diligently can be confident in the promises of His Word during challenging times. The life-giving Word of God is able to give us a hope that keeps us going. The psalmist says in verses 49 to 50, he says, Remember your word to your servant, for you have given me hope. My comfort in my suffering is this. Your promise preserves my life. To those of you who are going through difficult challenges during this time, what is your comfort? Your comfort in the midst of your suffering is this. God's promise, God's promises preserve your life. Thirdly, those who seek the Lord will experience His preservation power. Verses 90 to 92. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Your laws endure to this day, for all things serve you. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I like this. If your law had not been my delight, in other words, if the word of God had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. The psalmist knew very well that without his relationship with God and his dependence on the word of God, he would not have been able to sustain in his season of affliction. It was God's word that gave him the supernatural strength to go on. Fourthly, those who seek the Lord will experience his peace. Verse 165, the great peace have those who love your law and nothing can make them stumble. The psalmist expresses the deep-seated peace that those who love the word of God enjoy despite the outward circumstances. Wouldn't we want to experience such peace that nothing can rob us off in our moments of anxiety and calamity? These are just some of the wonderful manifestations of God's presence that those who know Him experience. There are many other things. But I would like to just conclude with this scripture that is found in Jeremiah 29, verse 13. It's a very familiar verse, and it says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This promise was given by the Lord to the Israelites when they were in captivity, when they were in exile in Babylon, far away from Jerusalem, where they used to worship God in His holy temple. And this promise was given amidst during a time when they were really hopeless, when, they f then when the future seemed so bleak, this promise was given to them. And the Lord said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You will seek me and find what? Freedom from your captivity? Hope against all odds? Solution to your problems? It is interesting to note that God did not promise us that we will find the things we are desiring for when we seek Him. He only promises this, that we will find Him when we seek Him with all our heart. He is our very rich reward. Far better than anything else we could ever long for. Because when we have Him, when we find Him, we have everything else we need. And this is God's promise to us this morning. When you seek me with all your heart, you will find me every time, 
everywhere. You will find me in a wilderness experience. You will find me in the fire of your tribulations. You will find me in the eye of the storm. In every season, even periods which seem so barren, so devoid of real purpose, so lacking in joy and victory, I will be there. Will you just close your eyes for a few moments? I have said many things, but will you just for a few moments close your eyes and let the Word of God sink in? I have said many things, but what is one thing that most resonates in your heart? The thing that resonates most is where God is soliciting a response from you. So what are you going to do about that particular aspect that He is bringing to your attention? He is bringing your attention to. You know, it's not just so much about asking God to help us to overcome a certain situation or to break free from a habit or to remove a distraction or to stop doing something we know is hindering us in our walk with God. But I think what is more important, what is important is for us, for you as you come to Him, and to say, Lord, I hear you and I'm responding to you and I want you to show me very clearly what I should do and how should I do it with the help of your Holy Spirit. Because all too often when we come to the altar, we ask the Lord to help us to overcome a situation, to help us to do something or to deliver us for something. The responsibility seems to be on God to do it. It's God's responsibility. So if I'm not delivered, well, probably God, it was, God didn't give me the victory or the big breakthrough that I was seeking for. But when we come to God and ask Him very specifically to show us what steps we can take for Him to deliver us and to help us in a particular situation, when we do this, we are taking responsibility for our spiritual walk. And when we take responsibility for our spiritual walk, when we take the responsibility to change, God will empower us and He will do His part in giving you the victory without a shadow of a doubt. In a moment's time, we will be opening up the altar and I know that there are many people who have many needs in our midst. And can I suggest that whatever need it may be, whether it be a need, in your family, in your work, in your finances, in your studies, in your ministry, in, in your relationships, in your health, or your future direction, can I make this suggestion that as you come, you come not just only presenting your needs to God, but as you come, you ask the Lord to teach you to seek Him and to know His ways and to understand Him to understand His purpose because we just don't want Him to make known His acts to us like the children of Israel. But we want Him to make known His ways to us like Moses because when we just don't want God to provide for us for one situation after another, but at the end of the day, we find that we don't really know Him and we are very unfamiliar with the way in which He works but you know, if we ask God to teach us to know His ways and to understand Him, then we find that when we are confronted with a difficult situation, we will not be easily shaken because we are familiar with Him and the way He works. We know His heart and then we can affirm our faith and our trust in Him. And you know what? God always honours faith because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So can we arise at this time and as the worship team would lead us in a song, feel free to make your way to the altar and know that God is here to meet with you. And when you seek Him, you will find Him in every situation you will find Him. He is your very rich reward. Will you do that?
just to take a few moments if you have been prayed for to just thank the Lord to thank the Lord and praise Him praise Him because He is worthy He is worthy Praise you Lord Hallelujah Thank you Jesus Thank you Lord Father as we come with one desire and that is to seek you with all of our hearts. We have this blessed assurance and that confidence that with all your heart, you love us. And because you love us with all of your heart, you desire your very best for each one of us. So Lord, we thank you this morning with great confidence. We are assured that before we bring to you all, all of our needs and challenges and difficulties, we want to say to you, our greatest desire is to love you. To love you with all of our heart. And with that love and that desire comes the knowledge to know you, to know you. And the more we know you, the more assured we are of living a victorious Christian life. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. There's nothing, there is absolutely nothing that you will cannot do nor will you not do what is good for every one of us and with this father we know we know today as we stand in your midst and around the altars we once again give of ourselves to you a refresh a renewed dedication consecration devotion commitment all of our heart, all of our heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love that is pouring out, pouring down, pouring into our lives right now. Thank you, Father. Receive his love today. Receive his love today. Receive his assurance today. Receive the Father's love today as we respond in our love towards Him. And as we do that, as we do that, everything that you are asking, every need that you have, every pain, every fear, Every uncertainty, some of you, you are so uncertain what the future will hold for you. You are so uncertain what others, how harmful others are towards you. Uncertainty over the future. Uncertainty over your job situation. And young people, uncertainty over what lies ahead but when you when we give our heart with all our heart we seek him with all our heart we love him there is no uncertainty hallelujah thank you lord there is every assurance that all will be well that all is well because we are journeying we are walking with a father who loves us who created us and who will provide for us the very best. So let's all thank him. Thank him with a blessed assurance. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So Father, we go rejoicing. We go thanking you in advance. All the good things you are going to allow today and throughout this week. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, for your healing. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your protection. Thank you, Lord, and we love you. 
In Jesus' name, amen.